Welcome to Dare to Dream. This is Debbie Dashinger and thrilled to have all of you join in with today's conversation. We're going to be talking about fear and values and ways that you can really optimize your life. First, I want to just give a big shout out of intention and thankfulness for intention to start to be created. This show has been nominated for two people podcast choice awards very psyched about that and for those of you who subscribe thank you and if you would like to if you'd like this level of conversation to come into your inbox to make it super easy you can subscribe to youtube slash debbie dashinger or you can listen to me on the radio iheart radio bbs radio radio public as well as many of the major podcast sites such as Stitcher and Spreaker and way more. So do take a minute to go there, subscribe and leave Dare to Dream a five-star review. The reason is other people who want this level of conversation can find it with great ease when you let them know it exists. A big shout out also to Dr. Dane here and Access Consciousness for sponsoring the show and for being a part of energy healing and transformation out into the world. If you want to know more about them, go to Dr. Dane here, H E E R.com, as well as accessconsciousness.com. They've got products and courses all around the world that will help you in your growth. So what if you could clarify your life and your career direction and be more self-governed and empowered? Well, my guest today is Dr. John Demartini, who is considered one of the world's leading authorities on human behavior and personal empowerment. And the knowledge he shares is a culmination of 39 years of cross disciplinary research. As an educator, he travels full-time around the world teaching and has appeared in many documentaries, including The Secret, The Opus, The Compass, and Oh My God, alongside celebrities such as Hugh Jackman, Seal, and Ringo Starr. You can learn out learn more about him at D, Dr. D. Martini. I'm going to spell that for you, Dr. D-E-M-A-R-T-I-N-I dot com, and I highly recommend you do. Dr. Demartini, welcome back to Dare to Dream. Thank you. Has it, has it been a while since we've done it? I'm, I'm now at 47 years since uh, I've been doing this. I, I think I'm, I'm aging a bit. I'm not sure <laughs> what the hell is here. Or time is frozen, one or the other. I believe it was, se- I've been doing this over 12 years, so it was easily eight years ago when you were yeah, last I'm on the program. It, it's been a while since we've gotten to do it, so. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm at, at 50, I started going back, so I'm now 35. I know, you look it, you're amazing. I'm 35, and my daughter's 35, we're crossing. She said, when we cross age, and she goes up to 36, and I go down to 34, she said, everything should be legitimate, we just need to cross bank accounts. And I told her, well, wait a minute. Uh, well, wisdom is another big one there. I mean, it's great that you're getting younger and retaining the wisdom, right? That's yeah, exactly. what really all about. <laughs> yeah, I have to tell you, I'm reading your book right now, The Values Factor, and I, I really should hold it up because it is so full of highlights. Your book is blowing my mind because right from the get-go, you start getting into a conversation about voids and values, and you answered something that has always been so confusing. So if it's okay with you, I want to tell you a little background about why it was confusing and what your illumination is creating. Sure. Sure. I once was with a girlfriend about five years ago. We were at a local mall, beautiful place. We're in Bloomingdale's. She showed me her favorite designer. And she picked up a shirt and said, oh, God, I would love to have this shirt. And she looked at the price tag, went, sort of rolled her eyes and went, well, you know, maybe in another life. Maybe not now. I can never afford that and put it back. And I stood there and said, that's crazy. You literally spend fifteen to twenty-five thousand dollars in a blink for a year program, but you wouldn't spend two two hundred fifty dollars on a beautiful blouse that you admire. And I never understood that. I have another friend who does real estate. He works his bum off, and yet where he spends all his time, which has been really incongruent for me, he is very healthy. He cooks everything from scratch. He hikes, he works out, he digests podcasts like uh, his IQ's off the hook. But it's really none of it got to do with real estate and his real estate business is not doing that well. And I've always thought, well, what is going on there? It's so strange to me, it's a miss. 
And your book starts out clearly by stating, look at where your attention is, look at where your intention is, look at what you value in your life, because if you're not living that life, that's why you'll see the struggle and the incongruencies. And so I'd love you to just talk about that because I feel like you could open up so much for people around this subject. Well, that's a, it's an important uh, topic. I was just in India a couple days ago and um, talking on that very topic because many people, I can ask people, how many of you want to be financially independent? And I can be in front of 20,000 people. And all of a sudden they'll all have the hands up. The whole room would just go nuts. And yeah, me, me, I want to be out. And then I said, after they've all pretty well hit, put their hands up, like 99 to 100% of the people, I say, how many of you now are? And all the hands go down. And less than 1%. I had seven, in one, one talk I had 5,000 people, I had seven people put their hands up for financial independence. Now, if I'm talking to a group of executives, it may be much higher. But worldwide, it's less than 1%. So I said, isn't it interesting that 99 to 100% of the people have their hands up, I want to be financially independent, but less than 1% do it. And the reason is, the ones that say they want to do it, but don't really have the values to actually do what it takes to do it, they have the fantasy of the lifestyles of the rich and famous, and they have a higher value on buying consumable mm -hmm. items that depreciate in value, so when they put their money out there, it goes down in value, not going up. And the people that are the few percent, or 1% or less, that really do have a wealth building, they put their money into things that are true assets that go up and appreciate in value. They don't want to spend their money on something that's not going to give them a return on investment, where everybody else wants immediate gratification instead of long-term return. And they don't understand that the hierarchy of their values dictates their financial destiny. And if you have a higher value on immediate gratifying consumables that appreciate, more than a long-term vision and value on appreciable asset building, probability of having financial independence is extremely low unless some sort of miraculous thing happens, a, a donation. But even people that receive large sums of money through inheritance, they will sometimes spend their money on depreciables and it'll disappear. Hmm. In fact, at one time in South Africa, I asked a very large group. I said, okay, we're going to do a little experiment to prove this point. We're going to have everybody write down in one minute. You have one minute to write down the 10 things you would do immediately if you were given 10 million US dollars right now. Now imagine I gave them all, all 10 million US dollars. You have one minute to decide exactly where that money's gonna go. On your mark, get set, go. And they have a minute to quickly write down, okay, what am I gonna do with that $10 million? And then when to the end of the minute, when I say stop, hand it to the person on the right, calculate how much money <clears throat> is remaining that's now uh, usable for investments. And it ranged from two to eight hundred thousand dollars on average. With, well, no more than two to eight hundred thousand dollars were typically left over. They bought a house that depreciates in value. It's not. It, it's a lifestyle, not an investment house. They put rentals in. They bought cars. They bought trips. They bought clothes. They bought. They spent their money on things that immediately went down in value the second you offered. I, mean, I had this one woman put up there. She's, I mean, if I had $10 million, I would immediately go buy this, this diamond ring I've been wanting from Tiffany's, right? But they just, you don't realize that the second you walk out of Tiffany's, the value of the diamond drops to one half. I can testify to that. You I better have a couple of pieces. Yeah. Smart, you buy a condo that at least in 10 years from now will be not just where you started with, but at least be doubled in value. But, but people don't realize that the hierarchy of their values dictates a financial destiny. And the hierarchy of their values is dictating how they perceive their life, perceive things in reality, make decisions and act. So the hierarchy of your values is dictating pretty well everything you're doing in your life, and, they don't, and most people don't realize that. So knowing what their values are and knowing what's driving those values, which are really the voids underneath those, will determine the level of congruency and fulfillment that they can have. So basically what I hear you saying is that people are living their lives as though they won the lottery. No matter what amount it is, it may not be a million. Even if they suddenly get a thousand extra dollars, they're basically spend, spend, spend. And at the end of the day, there is really nothing for them. All of that energy went out. Well, I know a woman who, no matter what she did, because she had a very high value on shoes and clothes and her appearance, no matter how much money she made, it would go into those things. And she was struggling to pay 
Uh, she was behind on taxes. She wasn't able to pay her bills at the time. And she, when we looked at how her money came in, how much money she earned, it has nothing to do with how much you make. It has everything to do with how you manage what you make and your hierarchy of values dictates how you manage it. So if all of a sudden she got the money in, she immediately spent it on all those things that were immediate gratifiers. And at the end of the month, then she goes, oh my God, I got to pay the bills. I got to scrounge to figure out how to get them and I can't afford them. And she was always having more month at the end of the money than money at the end of the month. And she was a slave to money instead of its master. Yes. Until you have money working for you, you're working for it. And if it's working for you, you're its master. And if you're working for it, you're its slave. And people don't realize that the hierarchy of their values is dictating how that's being managed. Well, and you, I, I, I train people and show people and got paid to consult with people on flipping it where they can now have enough value on wealth building that the money starts working for them. And without ever even increasing their income, all of a sudden they go, wow, I'm starting to save and invest money. And I now it's starting to grow for me. I said, yes, because you had a shift in your values. So if you don't have the values that build wealth, you can shift them. There's a science on how to do that. I explained it in the book, the values factor, but, and I've been doing it for years, over 40 years, I've been doing that. And I, and I'm absolutely certain that a person can shift their destiny because change your hierarchy of values, change your destiny. Your destination is a result of where you're focusing. Agreed. So many questions. Uh, I want to start with, will you give us one secret then? So people, obviously, I'm telling you in the first 20 minutes of reading this book, my mind was like exploding with clarity, like pieces I didn't understand previously. So highly recommended the values factor. Will you give us one secret therein, how we can understand and or align with the values to create some more freedom on the other end? Well, every decision a person makes, every perception, every decision and every action that a person takes, an individual takes, is based on what their values are, the heart of their values. So if you shift the values, you perceive differently. Let me give you an example. If you're a mother and you're, oh, 35 years old and you have three beautiful children under the age of five, and your highest value is those beautiful children. If you walk in a mall, you will spot children's clothes, children's education items, children's health items, children's entertainment items. And you'll spot them. You retain where the information, where you got them. You'll know how to go get them again next time efficiently. But you won't see business items. You won't be buying computers, IT equipment. That's not your value system. But you may be married to a husband, for instance, or a wife, depending on which side of the equation you are, uh, that has a high value on serial entrepreneurism and business. And they'll walk in the same mall and he won't see uh, children's clothes, children's health items. He won't see any of that stuff. He'll see computers and he'll, he'll look at what stores got the most people in it, buy stock in it. He will be thinking totally different because he filters his perceptual reality according to what his values are. And nobody has the right or wrong values. See, this is where a lot of people get trapped. They project their values onto others and expect other people to live in their values and thinking there's a right and a wrong value. But the world needs every value system out there in order to function. If everybody was a CEO, we wouldn't have a we wouldn't have companies at work. We need all different values in there, and nobody's right or wrong for them. They're just unique. But whatever those are, they're going to determine how you perceive and the decisions you make. Because every decision you make is based on what you believe will give you the greatest advantage or disadvantage to your highest value. And uh, and the same thing in action. You won't act if it's not valuable to you. You'll procrastinate, hesitate, frustrate, but you'll act if it's valuable to you. You'll take action on it. So that's why you are you have an advantage whenever you're setting goals that are aligned with your highest values compared to trying to set goals lower in the value hierarchy because of the pressure and conformity and fitting in to other people who are projecting their values onto you. And this is where a lot of people frustrate. They're, they're trying to fit in instead of stand out. They're trying to conform instead of build a normity. And they're basically living in the shadows of people instead of standing on the shoulders of giants and what's possible in their lives because they're not living congruently with what they value most, what's authentic to them. But if they want to change their values, that's also doable. Because anytime you stack up uh, associations, advantages and benefits and pleasures, and uh, you know the positives to a value, it goes up in value list. And anytime you associate drawbacks to services, downsides, et cetera, it goes down. So you can restack with, your, with asking quality questions and restack the list of what those values are and move them up and down. I, I do that every week in my breakthrough experience program for people. Mm. And all of a sudden a person, an individual that hasn't been able to get ahead financially 
unbelievably, all of a sudden in the next six months of their life, they're going, man, I've got $20,000 say, what the hell happened? Because their hierarchy of values changed, it made changes in decisions, change in perceptions, change in actions, and they had a different trajectory. Your hierarchy of values is, the reason I spent so much time writing that book and putting that book together is after 47 years of now teaching and 40 of which have been studying values, very few books are written on it. And yet it is the foundation and most important thing I found in all the 47 years about human behavior. And for some reason, it's just been not really written about that much. I mean, people talk about getting values, but they think in terms of morals and ethics and how you should be instead of what is your life demonstrate really valuable to you. And then we, we found out, you know, I've, I found that many times parents think, well, I need to give kids their values. Kids already are born with values. We need to learn how to communicate respectfully our values in terms of their values to get them engaged so they can expand but not be suppressed and then later have a midlife crisis in their life because they finally are freed and they're finally at now at the age where they used to subordinate to people who are authorities. And then they wake up and go, this isn't my life. What's true for me? But giving people permission to be authentic to their own values is liberating. And yeah. so I, I, I try my best to help people identify what it is, look at what they were, were going to create with that, and decide, do I want to rearrange the values or do I want to honor and set goals that are aligned with it? you got two options. Either go and do what you love through delegating or love what you do through linking and rearranging the value system. So I teach people how to do both of them because there's, there's, there's a, a science of each and there's a value to each. So for the listeners, the viewers, I want to link up what Dr. Martini said with my opening remarks, which is my aha upon reading his book was going back to the woman in Bloomingdale's who was picking up her favorite designer and saying how much she loved to own that shirt, but she couldn't possibly is that I suddenly saw, ah, her values are in self-development. So for her to throw all that money into growing, into healing, that was a report. And this gentleman I talked about who's in real estate, but where you see all his attention and time go is into health, into growing his mind, studying, enriching himself. Oh, maybe his career is actually misaligned. And that's why he's struggling Maybe he needs to be working more in this realm where his passion is and his time is ready. Well, anytime you set a goal that is not aligned and congruent with what you value most, your top value, you're automatically designed, biologically designed to self-depreciate. Whenever you set a goal that's high in your values, you go up in value, self-worth. Anytime you go down the list of values, you lower it. That's why we're here to fill our day with high priority actions, high values, that inspire us spontaneously, intrinsically, and delegate lower priority things. Because if we don't fill our day with high priority actions that inspire us, it fills up with low priority distractions that don't. And the distractions and things that depreciate us are feedback mechanisms to guide us to authenticity. And we think there's something wrong with this. There's nothing wrong. I, I, every weekend in the Breakthrough Experience, I have people thinking there's something wrong with them. There's some sort of weakness, some sort of a, you know, a problem in their life. They're simply setting incongruent objectives mm -hmm. and they don't know themselves well enough to do it. And they haven't looked at what their real life is demonstrating as valuable to them. And the second they do, their self-worth goes up. Their, their discipline goes up because you're automatically spontaneously called to do what's high in your value. And when you're trying to do something that's low in your value, of course you're going to procrastinate and go do something that's really high, but you didn't know that was really high. And I look at, I have a value determination process. I look at how people fill their space because they fill their space with things that are valuable to and they get they toss everything that's not how they spend their time they make time find time spend time on things that are really valuable to them where what energizes they have more energy at the end of the day than when, when they're doing things high in the values and they're drained at the end of the day if they don't where do they spend their money they make money find money spend money and, and and use money for things that are valuable to themselves even though they may think they don't have a, enough money for something it's because it's not really valuable they, they make money for it if it's valuable I look at where they're most ordered. I look at where they're most disciplined. I look at what they think about, visualize, and internally dialogue to themselves about, about how they want their life that shows evidence of coming true. I look at what they converse with other people about most, because they keep wanting to bring the conversation around what's valuable to them. People come up to you and say, how's your kids, or how's your golf game, or how's your investments, or how's your business, how's your health, when that's what's valuable to them. How's your yoga coming? And the next one is basically what inspires them? What's common to the people who inspire their life? 
What's, what really inspires and brings tears of inspiration to them consistently? The next one is what is that the three most consistent, persistent goals they have that shows evidence of coming true? And the last one is what do they spontaneously want to learn about, read about, study about, watch YouTubes about, and DVDs about? Because that is what they value most. And if you answer those 13 questions and look at what's common to them repeatedly, they'll reiterate themselves and reveal what's really valuable. And the second you structure your life around that, you'll accept. And I've had people that think they have low self-esteem and have problems and they're introverts and stuff like that. The second we find out what their real value is, because they've been banging their head against the wall, going against their own nature, trying to be what other people expect them to be. And then once we get them congruent, amazingly, they open up and they're confident and they do things they never have been thought they could do because now they're congruent. So one of the most significant things a person can do is identify what's truly the inspiration, the calling, the highest value, what the ancient Greeks call the telos, mm. and find out what that is and structure your life and be smart enough to structure your life and prioritize your life and delegate the rest and get on with doing what's really meaningful to you. You'll excel. You'll wake up your natural born leader. You'll expand your space and time horizons. You'll wake up your executive center where you have more inspired vision, more strategic planning, more objectivity, more uh, self-governance, more mastery. And you won't be a victim of history. You'll be a master of your destiny. Mm. I've always thought that our wounds indicate where our gifts are, right? If we're willing to take it on and heal it and do a journey with it and get to the other side, we have a lot of wisdom. And usually the wound, interestingly enough, points us in the direction of our life. I was so fascinated by the fact you had different words for it and you called it voids make values and you have this amazing story uh, as a child where you had to use braces and would you share that story about what you said to your father and what ensued well you know i i, I was born i had quite a few challenges uh, when i was born my arm and leg were both turned in and I had to wear braces on my arm and leg till i was four and um you know, I, you weren't popular with that. <laughs> well, running around, people avoided you. They didn't know what to deal with it because it's like a Forrest Gump kind of thing. And people kind of avoided you and you couldn't run fast. You couldn't, you kind of felt constrained. So at age four, I, I begged my dad, I want to get out of these braces. And I promised him I would keep my arm and leg straight. And he said, if you keep your arm and leg straight, fantastic. If not, I got to put you back in. Well, I made a very strong point to not have to go back in those things. And all I want to do is run. And man, today I'm on the run. I've, I've, I, next year will be 20 million miles of travel. <laughs> 20 million miles of travel. And I think that had something to do with that way back then. Then I had speech and problem when I was a one, uh, just about one and a half or so when I was trying to do, make sounds and things more effectively. Uh, I had to go to a speech pathologist and had to wear you know, strings and buttons in my mouth to use muscle exercises. I remember when I was a little kid, I was holding a, a button in my mouth and in, in doing these exercises because I couldn't pronounce properly and couldn't use my mouth properly. I'm a professional speaker today. In first grade, I was told by my first grade teacher, he'll never be able to read. He'll never be able to write. He'll never be able to communicate because my arm was twisted and writing. I wrote backwards and that didn't make sense to write. And, uh, and speaking uh, was, was awkward. I was gimped with my leg. And then I also had uh, dyslexia and I was left-handed, which were considered sinister kids. You know, I wasn't smart. So my parents said, well, if I put you in these braces and your right arm is locked, you'll have to learn how to use the right hand, which gave me ambidextrous. But I, I was told in first grade, I'd never be able to read, never be able to write, never be able to communicate in a remote thing, never go very far in life. Hell, that's what I do today. <laughs> the very thing they tell you you'll never be able to do may just be the very thing you're destined to do. Watch. Now I've read you know, over 30,200 and something books. I've now written over 100 books. I, I traveled nearly 20 million miles. I'm a friggin' wealthy multimillionaire today. And, um, you know, I've reached five something billion people with radio, television, newspapers, magazines, podcasts, uh, movies, all kind of stuff. Where the thing they tell you you won't be able to do may just be the very destined thing. Absolutely. And so you talked a little bit about the teachers telling you to your face and your parents to your face, look, he can't read, he's never going to be able to write, he's probably not going to amount to anything which is profound and could have influenced your life. And it did influence some of your life. For, until How I was 17. Until I, I was 18, it was my, I was a street kid. I left school and I was on, this, on the streets until I was almost 18 years old. And what I love, so I want to say the ending first. 
if someone were to say Dr. John D. Martini to me, I would say hands down, genius, genius. I followed you for years, had you on the show before, I've heard you in person. I think you're a genius. Please tell us when you were living, I would say on the streets, but you're living on the beach, in a tent, you almost died, a woman rescues you, she takes you to a health food store to hear somebody whose name will be recognized, and I'd love you to say, what is the affirmation he gives you to say every day to turn your life around? Well, I was uh, surfing Lanai Kea, which is a beautiful wave on the North Shore of Oahu, it's a big one, and uh, I almost died because my diaphragm stopped. If you ever surfed a big wave and your diaphragm stops, that's not a good thing to happen. But I had, and my hands uh, cramped up and my whole right side of my body froze. And I ended up going over the, over the wave and down into the coral and rocks and stuff. And my board was shattered and I was beat up pretty bad. And I made it up to the rocks and onto the, the highway, the Kamehameha Highway, and hitchhiked into Haleiwa. And there I went into this IGA supermarket. And for some reason, I've never drank it before, and I don't think I've ever drank it since, buttermilk. I went back to the back and just started guzzling this buttermilk. I didn't pay for it. I just started guzzling this buttermilk for some reason. I started, I was having, having difficulty breathing and I was having cramps and I had this yearning for buttermilk. And I walked out and I fell unconscious out in the parking lot. To this day, I don't know how I got from the parking lot to my tent, but somebody must have recognized where I was in the jungle tent. And uh, three, three and a half days later, uh, I, I remember coming out of unconsciousness and that lady came to the tent and saw me there and she said, oh my God, you're dehydrated. She ran off and got me this fluid uh, juice, mixture of juices and stuff and helped clean up the tent. And I don't know if she hadn't to come there. I don't know if I'd be alive today, but she helped clean up the tent and get me and then walk me with my arm around, you know, kind of help me, walk me to this little Vim and Vigor health food store and got me some carrot juice, which I was able to stomach and um, I started going there daily and a few days into that I was leaving the health food store and there was a little flyer on the door a special guest speaker Paul C. Bragg for Bragg's amino acids and Bragg's health food and products uh, guest speaker Sunset Recreation Hall 730 uh, yoga class it's some, he was a guest speaker to yoga class and something you know was saying to me go there and I, I went there and I was amongst 35 students sitting on a little wooden floor on little mats and towels. And that gentleman that night, Paul Bragg, who was a pretty determined guy, he lectured and I felt he was speaking to me. I mean, I don't know about anybody else there. I just know for me, he was, he was talking to me in my life at that moment. And he basically said, we have a body, we have a mind and we have a soul and the body must be guided by the mind and mind must be directed by the soul in order to master ourselves. We need to set goals for our family, ourself, our family, our community, our city, our state, our nation, our world, uh, and beyond for 100, 120 years. I mean, he was saying stuff that nobody ever talked to me about. And it was like, whoa, this is, this is inspiring. And then he get, took us through this guided imagery meditation experience. And in that meditation, I, I literally saw myself st standing and walking through an archway onto a balcony in front of a million people in this giant square. And I saw myself speaking. I was going, whoa. And I was there in a virtual reality. And I have uh, Andrew Tischler from Melbourne, Australia, is a famous painter, has painted that painting and it's sitting in my office of that picture that I saw when I was 17. It's an inspiring painting if you saw it. And um, so I, I, uh, that night I made a decision that I, I, I was going to do what this man did when someday when I'm his age, I'm going to find a 17-year-old young man, I'm going to pass this torch to him. And I knew that I knew right then that I, I, wanted, to, I wanted to overcome my learning problems as the first night in my life I ever thought I might be able to be intelligent, that I might be able to learn how to read and, and, and do something with my life. Not that surfing wasn't great, it was, but I just felt there was more. And then he said that he's doing a class in, the, in the Fort Derussi on the other side of the island each morning. And at 5.45, I hitchhiked in there and I was there with him. 50, 60, 70 year old, 80 year old people there with, with him. And for the next three weeks, I'd learned everything I could from this guy. And finally, he said, I'm going to back to Mount Shasta and the Santa Barbara area, and I'm going back, and I hope to see you all someday. And I'm like, oh, wait a minute now. This is my mentor leaving. And I thought I had really confidence. But when he started to leave and said this is his last day to speak there, I was going, whoa. And I never had the courage to walk up to the guy because he was kind of bigger than life. 
And I walked up to him and I said, Mr. Bragg, you said three weeks ago that when I was in the Sunset Recreation Hall, that whatever I decided for my destiny, my, my, my life that night would become my destiny. And he said, that's right, young man. He said, well, sir, I, I saw that I was going to be a teacher and I was going to step foot in every country and travel and teach and I was going to be intelligent. And he says, well, sir, I don't even know how to read. I've never read a book from cover to cover. I have speech problems. I have dyslexia. I don't know how I'm going to do that. I just know that I want to do that. I don't know how to do that. And he said, he said, that's not a problem, son. You have any other problems? I said, no, sir. He says, here's what you do. I want you to say this one statement to yourself every single day. Never miss a day for the rest of your life. You got to promise me. Never miss a day for the rest of your life. And he says, if you say this statement every single day, sooner or later, the cells of your body will tingle with it and so will the world. So I said, okay. And he said, he said, I want you to say that I am a genius and that I apply my wisdom. And he made me say it over and over and over and over again until I closed my eyes and I felt it. And then he patted me on the shoulder. He said, that's it. I want you to never miss a day for the rest of your life. That was 47 years ago. I've never missed a day. And I said every day. But I now know that a genius is one who listens to the inner voice and follows the inner vision of their soul and obeys. Mm. And doesn't let the world on the outside interfere with the calling on the inside of what they feel called to do. So I started saying that. And it just started, it started shifting. I, I started meditating every day. I started eating differently. I went to the first health food store and I picked up my first book to try to read, which was Chico's Organic Gardening in You, because the guy on the cover looked like a hippie, looked like me, and I thought, if that guy could write it, I bet I could read it. And I just started to focus on the idea that I'm, I have the capacity to do more with my life. And that led me to eventually hitchhike, well, flying back to Los Angeles from Honolulu, hitchhiking back to Texas, taking a GED, passing the GED, which is a high school equivalency, because I never did finish high school, getting a college entrance exam and guessing and passing with that little statement, and then I failed my first test in school, and I almost gave up. And then my mom said to me, uh, after I'd failed the test, she said, son, whether you become a great teacher here and philosopher and travel the world like you dream, whether you ride back big waves in Hawaii like you've done, or whether you return to the streets and panhandle as a bum, your father and I are going to love you no matter what. And I went, after that, I made a determination that I was going to amass this thing called reading and teaching and philosophy and and I was going to do whatever it takes and travel over distance and pay whatever price to get my service of love across this planet. And I got up and I thanked my mom. And I said, I'm not going to let any human being on the face that are stop me. And I'm not even myself. And I hugged my mom. I went into my room. I got a dictionary out. And I started memorizing 30 words a day in a dictionary, spelling them, the meaning, proper use of a word and a sentence. And my mom helped me, made sure I did not go to bed at night until 30 new words were memorized and learned, until my vocabulary was strong enough to pass school. And then I started excelling. I just started taking off. And I just wanted to read. I just wanted to learn. And then almost a year later, my mom, not even a year later, my mom said, John, John, what do you want for your birthday for Christmas? Because I was born on Thanksgiving Day. She said, she said that, and I said, I just want the greatest teachings on the face of the earth, the greatest writings humanity's ever created from around the world for the greatest mind. And she said, are you sure you don't want a t-shirt? <laughs> I, said, I said, no, mom, I want the greatest teachings on the planet from the greatest minds in every field. Well, he, she had a brother, uh, Uncle Ralph, who was a professor at MIT, who was absolutely brilliant. And he, as a gift, sent two giant six by six foot by six foot wooden crates on a flatbed truck to our home with thousands of books in there. They laid it on the ground and I opened them up with a crowbar and filled my room with thousands of books and just read for 18 to 20 hours a day. And I started to excel. And I started having students gather and students asked me questions and I started growing and went from the community to the city, to the state, to the nation, to now 151 countries. So it's just a matter of whatever you set your mind to and you never give up on it, you can do something. It's just a matter of something. It's gotta be something that's truly high in your value that you're inspired by. Thank you so much. That was beautiful. Wow. Thank you for really pulling back the curtain and being so real. And uh, strangely enough, thank you, life, for everything it brought to you, that you had the resilience to make a completely different decision about what was possible and who you were choosing to be. I mean, that's like a real testimony that anybody- well, I, I believe that everybody inside has a calling, something that's truly high in their values. And I absolutely love helping people find that and get that because you don't need motivation on the outside when you get that. I don't need motivation. 
and I'm not a motivational speaker. I don't use rhetorical persuasion to get people to do things that's not really inspiring to them. I want them to find out what it is so they don't need a motivator on the outside. Motivation is a symptom, not a solution for great humanity. We're going to take a very quick break, and then we're going to be right back. This is Dare to Dream, where I feature successful, fascinating leaders who have created major things in their lives and for this planet. And what would you do if you knew that you could not fail? What would you choose, and what would it take for you to feel completely bold and free? You can be part of the Dare to Dream team. We are the number one transformation conversation on air and on podcast, and it is available to you for free. Today, you can help the show by donating a dollar or more, and you can make a difference. Go to patreon.com slash dare to dream. You have a big purpose to fulfill. I'd love to see you create that. And patreon.com slash dare to dream is about supporting you and those conversations that show you better ways for your life and to create those really big, awesome dreams into your reality. If you are just tuning in and we have already started, this is Debbie Dashinger, Dare to Dream. I'm interviewing Dr. John Demartini. You can go to his website, Dr. Demartini, everything he's talking about, products, books, programs, his events, and he literally speaks all over the world. There are no excuses. You can go see him anywhere. Just check out his events page. He's a human behavioral specialist, an educator, and an international author. John, I want to go back to a point you made about something that Paul Braggs said, where he was talking about having that vision for now, for your tribe, for your community, your state, your city, your country, and beyond 120 years into the future. I know that you're somebody who's big on giving back through education and social initiatives, and you've educated young adults. You have gone back, right, to give where you need it, actually and people also from disadvantaged backgrounds. Have there been, with that philanthropy, any success stories that you feel really yummy or proud about you can share? <laughs> well, I got a mind blower, there's many of them. Um, I was speaking at the Western Hotel, the Western Arbala Hotel in Cape Town, South Africa. And there's about, I don't know, maybe 800 people. I, I couldn't tell you, 600, 800 people. I don't know, there's hundreds of people there. and. I was speaking on personal financial management and what you can do to turn your financial challenges into opportunities. And way, way in the back of the room was a young man who was about 14 years old. I did not get to meet him that night, but he was there. I came back, that was September. And then I came back in December to the same location, same audience, another about seven, 800 people. I don't know how many people were there. And um, this time after I finished speaking, <clears throat> I was signing books and getting pictures, you know how they do today with all the iPhones and stuff, and hugs and things. And patiently, there was this young man waiting to the very end. And I had probably 250 people, at least a third of that room came up and wanted pictures and gathered around and wanted pictures and you know questions and stuff. He patiently waited for over an hour and a half and I, I stay usually to the end, right, till everybody, till they, they all go. And here's this young boy, he's 14 years old, he comes up and he's the last person there. And he says, Dr. Demartini, you inspired me. And I said, fantastic, how so? Now, when I looked at him, I saw um, really some beat up old clothes. His jeans were about... I'm going to say eight or more inches longer than his legs. And they were bold, folded up and folded up again. And he had a, a little rope tying his waist in the loops of his pants. And it was scrunched. So he had a pair of pants on that were probably way bigger than his, but it was done that way. He had a shirt that had some holes in it. And he was a young boy. He said, I, I live in Kailicha. Kailicha is a township, which is a very concentrated um, township in South Africa. And he said, my mother and father both died of AIDS. I'm the oldest in the family. I'm 14 and I'm raising nine kids. Wow. I, um, I work at a mud brick uh, factory and I stack mud bricks and then they dry in the sun. 
and I make 60 cents a day and I walk 45 minutes to work and 45 minutes back. 15 cents every day goes to a woman to educate and oversee the kids when I'm gone. The, the, another 15 cents since your talk in September, I've been setting aside now 15 cents in rands at the time is about seven rands to a dollar. So multiply 15 cents times seven rands and that gives you about a dollar or a hundred rands a day. That's what he was saying, whatever it was. Seven times 15. Now, he was saving 15 cents a day, living, paying 15 cents for a woman to take care of his family. And the rest of it, 30 cents a day, went to paying for food and clothes and everything else they had. And they lived in a shack that didn't have water, didn't have electricity, that had a mud floor, that had to have plastic on top of it because if it rained, which didn't rain a lot, but if it did rain in the rainy seasons, you'd have to put plastic up to keep it from leaking. They had to go to a bathroom, which is about a hundred yards away in the little, in little kind of ravine. And he's raising nine brothers and sisters that are all younger than him. And he said, I have saved equivalent of us dollars, $7 and 50 cents since September. And I, we'll have by this time next year at Christmas time, uh, a minimum of $30 at the rate that I'm going, a minimum. And I'm putting $20 down <clears throat> on a new shack of a $200 shack that has a 54% interest rate mm -hmm. to be able to buy a house, a shack. It's $200. It'll have an electrical light. It won't have water, but it'll have a, a, a flooring and it'll be brand new metal, and it won't leak. And that light will be something we can see at night. And it says, I'm gonna learn how to read. I'm gonna to go to the library like I've been doing, because you inspired me to want to read. My mission is to see if I can get a thousand young boys who are in the same situation throughout Kailicha to try to change their life. Because you said that if I don't have a cause bigger than themselves, I won't get beyond myself. Well, a year later, I had the opportunity to see the shack. Now I could have bought him a shack. I could just here, take 200 bucks and buy a shack. But if I'd done that, I robbed him of his own inspiration and achievement in his own story. And I got, you know, judged for not giving him $200 on the spot by people who don't understand how important it is for somebody to do it on their own, not be, dependent on somebody else. But the boy did amazing things and he not only had more than $30 because he, 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 he did what I told him that September. He's, I went to my boss and I said, now that I've done everything that you requested, anything else you want me to do, I want to do it. I want to earn more. I want to never want to ask for something for nothing. I don't want to be entitled. I want to earn more. What can I do to help your company grow and prove that I make a profit that you can share some of that with me? And he went out and earned more money. He prioritized what he was doing. He saved it. He bought the shack. He was inspired. He inspired other young people. And that's the kind of story that, that's what's possible. It doesn't matter where you've come from. It doesn't matter what you've gone through. It doesn't matter what you're going through. What matters is, are you now applying the principles to stand the test of time that leads to great achievement and wakes up genius and possibilities in human beings? And he's a, he's a classical example. I had another boy also there that came from a different township named Yusuf, who was bust in miles away and had earned the right to come to a young adults inspired destiny program that I was putting on. And they had to write a paper why they deserved to be there, why they got to be selected. And he came there and one of the requirements to come to this program was that you had to write down the five most significant things of whoever your hero is, the five traits that make up the hero that you look up to. Yeah. So I made all these kids sit down and write those five traits down, and then where in their life do they display and demonstrate those traits until they can see they have those traits as much as they see in their heroes. They have, that's their responsibility to find that, because nothing's missing in them. At the level of the essence of the soul, nothing's missing in us. At the level of our senses, things appear to be missing in us. We play small because we think there's things missing in us, but there's never something missing. 
And what I do is I helped him see where he had all those traits. And then after I got through, I said, I saw that he was finished. I said, Yusuf, did you finish? He said, yes, sir. I said, and did you own all the traits of your hero? Yes, sir. He said, and who did you pick as your hero? He said, you, sir. And I said, me, sir. And he says, yes, sir, because I intend to be a speaker like you. I want to inspire people and I want to write books and, and, and I, I want to be intelligent. And I said, fantastic. And I said, then stand up. If you've owned all the traits and you're not frightened of getting up and speaking, you've got a message because those are the mission, have a message, get up and speak. And he got up and he did a presentation that blew everybody's mind. He's a young teenage boy. And here he is standing up and they gave him a spontaneous standing ovation, including me. So the next day after I did the talk, I was inspired by him and got a picture with him. Next day I was doing radio and television interviews throughout the day. And I brought him up because he inspired me. I said, look, I, they said, Dr. Martini, what are you in town for? I said, I'm doing a young adults inspired destiny for kids, you know? And they said, well, you know, what's the, what is that about? I, I told them the story about Yusuf. And they said, I want to have him come on the show and I want to hear him do an interview. So he got on radio and television the very first week. Like that week, he got on radio and television, shared his story and got opportunities. Has now published a book and is speaking. And, it, and it's so inspiring to see that it was him not believing that he had something, but then realizing it wasn't missing. Mm. That's a very important thing because the voids in our life determine our values and the voids are perceptual. People think we're missing something, but we're not. Once we realize it's not missing, we come from a different perspective. Instead of coming from lack, we come from a, a place of positioning and strategy. And he changed his perceptions. And so I, I, I help people find that because they're, they're, they're amazingly, there's, there's a magnificence inside people that people don't recognize. They play insignificant instead of magnificent because they're comparing their lives to other people instead of comparing their daily actions to their own dreams. And when you're a, kid, a cat looking at a fish thinking, oh, I, I'm terrible as a swimmer. There's something wrong with me. Or if you're a fish expecting to climb a tree, you're going to beat yourself up. But if you're a fish and you love your, your swimming, you'll honor it. You'll, you'll swim like a master. And helping people find out what their highest values are and where they're already excelling and that nothing's missing, but they keep expecting to live outside their values and they think things are missing is liberating to people. I'm amazingly liberating. And, I, and it's just so inspiring to watch them when they get that click and they just get it and tears come in their eyes and they go, I now know what I'm up to. That's a very amazing story. Wow. 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 And clearly he was aligned when you asked him that question. Are you really there? Are you really cleared for this? Because how, what an amazing manifestation that was for, to get up uh, with so much belief in yourself and deliver. And, and there's so much to what that story. Um, and there's a lot of that in uh, things that I'm playing with in my life a little bit now, which is to, to supersede fear, right? I'm not talking dark alley fear. I'm talking the kind that limits one and actually appears to be real when in fact it's just something fabricated in one's mind. And so I'm recognizing the places and spaces where I've used fear and to limit me and instead to say, I just did it last Friday night. There's something called the Greater Good Party here in Los Angeles, and it literally is an amazing couple who got together and invite amazing, talented human beings and say, we want to create more good on this planet. Let's come together. And part of it is speaking and beautiful poems and things. And I got to call it like hours before the party saying, oh, you have this gift nobody uh, much knows about, but apparently you used to be an actress and a singer. Would you come sing? My mind says, it's been 12 years since I sang professionally. And then my mind says, baby, that's fear speaking. We know one answer and it's the year of saying yes. And I picked up the phone. I said, I'm in. What do you need? And I showed up and I did it. And it's like uh, to, to claim one stake like that is it's life changing. It literally can change your trajectory to keep up with the yeses and show up for them. Well, I, I used to have uh, people come up to me and said, well, Dr. DiMartini, this is actually before I was a doctor and then after I got my doctorate. And, I, and they, they said, can you speak on this topic? I said, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and then I had a system in Houston and in the, in the 19th, late 70s and early 80s, there was no um, fax machine. There was no, there's microfiche. That's it. 
And what I did is I hired a person at the downtown Houston Public Library who was a researcher for me. And, and, it, and so when somebody said, well, can you speak on this topic? Absolutely. And then they would do is they would go down and I'd get a researcher go and dig every single article, every single book, anything that had that information on it. And they would ship it to me. And I'd pay them you know, hundreds of dollars to ship this to me. And then I would speed read through everything. And I was ready before I did my presentation. And I said, I, I'm not going to wait for opportunities. I'm going to make get the opportunities and then I'm going to prepare and use that as an incentive to see what I'm capable of devouring and learning and stuff. And that was a great exercise for me to, to put myself under deadlines and put myself under pressure uh, because I, I was not a matter of, you know, when you speak, you normally have no problem speaking about something you know, but it's when you don't know, when you're speaking in front of somebody you think has more knowledge than you, you can be, you know, inhibited. Just like if you think there's somebody out there that can sing greater than you, you'll be more inhibited. But I just said, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get ready. Preparation meeting opportunity, right? Yeah. I'm just going to get ready and make it happen. And I found that that was extremely valuable. And I did that as often as I possibly could. I didn't care what the topic was. And that diversified my background and allowed me to have a multidisciplinary approach. What is your take on overwhelm? That seems to be the most prevalent word bantied about today when you ask, yeah, how are you? Overwhelmed. How's work? I'm so overwhelmed. How's your life? Oh, you know, if only I could, I'm just so overwhelmed. What is that about? Like, I understand everything's amped up. It's up leveled. We have more stimulation. I comprehend that. On another level, though, that seems to be this new MO or default that many people- but, You know, it's not because of anything on the outside. No, it's you not saying no to low priority things hmm. and not saying yes to the highest priority thing and hmm. sticking to the highest priority thing and delegating the rest. Okay. You know, I research, write, travel, teach. That's it. So when I get through this one before my next interview, I'm going to be researching. I'm working on a textbook on nuclear physics right now. So I'm, I'm, I'm a uh, underachiever. <laughs> yeah. so I, I, every minute I got, I'm onto that the research. I research, write, travel, teach. Everything else is delegated. I haven't driven in literally 30 years now, October will be 30 years. I haven't cooked since I was 24. You know, I, I, people joke about it and they say, well, you know, you even delegate lovemaking to your girlfriend, <laughs> other people for your girlfriend. I said, well, I think she deserves the best that she can get. And if I'm not the best, she deserves the best. You know, I got to love her for that. I'm, I'm joking about it. But I delegate everything because mm. I found out that anytime I do low priority things, I devalue myself. And every time I do the highest priority thing, I re-expand myself and I wake up my most powerful state. So I don't want to do, I want to find that one thing that I'm greatest at and focus on that. Now, mine is researching and learning. So I will take on any challenge when it comes to researching and learning because I love that. And you tend to want to, you want to not restrict yourself. You want to go after challenges when you're inspired by it. But everything else I delegate. I don't do administrative financials, everything. I have it all electronically structured. There's no way anything can interfere with my objectives because I've got it structured where it's, that's what the job is. And if people are working for me, their job is to make sure that my objectives are being met. Mm. If not, I let go of them and I get somebody who's inspired to do that and get the job done. And if you surround yourself with people who love to do what you're going to delegate so you can go and do what you love and you go out and serve people earning an income to pay for the delegation, it's, it's amazing what life can offer you. Yeah. So it's not overwhelming because of something out there. It's overwhelming because you haven't prioritized your life and you're trying to do too many things that aren't really the most important things. Interesting. So read his book, The Values. And, and by the way, there's 13 amazing questions in there. Um, I'm, I'm getting all my friends uh, really to get the book and do it because I think this is a game changer. And part of uh, one of the things in the book is about relationships, three types of relationships, careless, careful, and caring. Can you share specifically what is a truly caring relationship about between two well, people? We go through life and we, we often judge people. And if we look down to people and get puffed up and get arrogant and talk down to them and try to project our values into them and try to get them to live in the way we want, that's care less. We care less about them than ourselves. And we project self-righteously with pride our values onto people. Then we also have times when we minimize ourselves and look up to people, put them on pedestals. And now what we do is we inject their values and try to live in their values, which is futile. Both those other ones are futile. 
And what that is, is basically careful. You're walking on eggshells, worrying about what people think about you, trying to please them all the time. And this is where most people go. They walk in a mall and they see people more successful, more intelligent, more financially viable, more stable relationship, more socially connected, more spiritually aware, better fitness. And then they minimize themselves, exaggerate them, inject their values, try to live in their values, set goals and aren't theirs, beat themselves up and wonder why it's not working. Hmm. And then there's caring relationships where you have equanimity within yourself. You're neither proud nor ashamed. You're being yourself. Because you're not, when you're proud or ashamed, you're not being yourself. When you're really yourself, you're authentic. And when you do, you have equity between you and others. You're not above or below them. There's equity, an equation that's balanced. And now you're communicating what you would love in terms of what they would love. And you're respecting what their values are and communicating what you value in terms of their values with dialogue, not alternating monologues. And caring is the one that keeps the ring on the finger. And caring relationships needs to be with kids, employees, customers, social context. That same law applies to every relationship we ever work with. And what about uh, powerful relationship communication strategies? Is there one, if somebody has a desire to return to love, um, to make this equanimity that you're talking about, what would be your one recommendation to do that? Oh, there's, a, there's two things that I can, I can guarantee work. I mean, I've, I've not had it fit, fail once. And it's simply, there's two exercises. One is go and do, on my website, there's a value determination process. It's a 13-step questionnaire that I mentioned earlier. It's complimentary. It's free. They can do it. It's private. No one will see it except you. You can store it. You can come back to it. You can do it again. You can watch your evolution of your values. But just do that. Go in there and do it more than once to make sure you're not bullshitting yourself. Because many times you write down what you think it should be, ought to be, wish it be, or what it once was, used to be, or hope it will be. you got to write down what your life demonstrates. Because your life demonstrates what you really have as values. But you determine your values. You determine the person you're in a relationship's values. Care enough. Every human being wants to be loved and appreciated for who they are. And who they are revolves around their highest value. Hmm. My highest value is teaching. I'm a teacher. That's my identity. The mother who has the three children at age 35, her highest value is mothering. She's a mother. Whatever your highest value is, your identity, ontological identity revolves around. Once you find that out, for you and the person you're in relationship with, that's the first step. You have to respect them because they want to be loved for that. Not for what you want to make them, not for what you need to fix them into, not the fantasy you're comparing to and punishing them if they don't match. They want to be loved for who they are. And they are both sided. They have, they're, they're not a one-sided person, always up, never down. They have both sides, and they want to be loved for both. Mm. So the first thing is identify their top value and ask this question. How specifically is this individual dedicated to the fulfillment of that highest value, attempting to fulfill their, what's most meaningful and important to them? How is them doing that and their life spent focused on that? How is it helping me fulfill mine? And answer that question 25 times. And don't stop and come up with bullshit answers. I don't know. I can't find it. That's the problem. They won't change. Just answer the question. How is who they are helping me become who I dream? And then turn around and do the same thing back. How is what I'm dedicated to helping them fulfill what they're dedicated to? And take the top three values of theirs, top three values of yours, and link those values back and forth. That's about 150 value links. It takes three hours to do. When you're done, your respect level, your appreciation level, your heart opens because you're realizing there's nothing to fix in them. Mm. For the first time, there's nothing to change, nothing to wish they had to be different. And there's nothing you need to fix in you. And you have a deep respect for each other. And there's a new relationship done in. Then the next question is what I call the Demartini method. It's a series of questions that I teach in the breakthrough experience. Whatever they've done that you've admired or despised, some trait, some action, some inaction that you perceive them displaying or demonstrating that you admire or despise most, ask what are those? Because you've stored in your subconscious mind accumulated misperceptions of who they are, hmm. and those are affecting you in your behavior with them. But ask, what do you admire most and despise most? Then you go and ask, go to a moment where and when you have displayed or demonstrated in your perceptions those same behaviors, those same traits, action, and actions, where were you? When were you? Who did you demonstrate to and who perceived you that way? And go and do that until you can own every single thing you see in them that you're emotionally charged about 100% quantitatively and qualitatively. And it will level the playing field and make you realize there's nothing there to judge. And if you thought it was something you resented, you then ask, how did it serve you? 
And if it's something you're admiring, how did it just serve you? And level it out. Because if you infatuate with them, you'll minimize yourself to them. If you resent them, you'll minimize them to you. And you're basically in a dial an alternating monologue, not dialogue. And if you go in and level that field and follow that process, all you're going to end up with is tears of gratitude and you want to embrace them in your arms and love them for who they are. And that's what people want. So go to drdmartini.com for this test. I know that's what I'm doing this weekend. I'm, I'm so like, I don't turned on, blown away all of this by what's possible here and by the stuff I know it's opening up in me. So I am doing that. And if you guys do it too, please let me know if you want to write in and give me some idea of the results or the things that insights that you're starting to gain or the freedom you're starting to get. I'd love to hear. Uh, Dr. Demartini, this is Dare to Dream. So what are you next, Dare to Dream? What are your future dreams and goals? <laughs> I got about, uh, believe it or not, I have 24 volumes of objectives, gratitudes, posthumous biographies, metrics of all the goals I'm working on. I have not yet been to every country. I have students in every country on the earth now. We've got documented students in, through social media on every continent. I've been to 151 countries. I've done the breakthrough experience in 63 countries. I've got another one, uh, two more coming up, uh, India and, and uh, Sri Lanka. But um, I, I'm still working on every country on the face of the earth. And we almost got into Mecca. We were almost got snuck into Mecca by some Arabian uh, uh, Kuwaitis and Arabian uh, royalty there. So I'm hoping to get in there because I'd like to do something even in Mecca. But I, 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 my goal is to continue to hit the, each of those countries. I'm going to keep riding. I do it every day. I keep researching, I'm going to do that every day. I research, write, travel, teach. And that's what I love doing most. And I, of course, I get the opportunity now to do these type of uh, interviews to help me reach people I wouldn't be able to reach. And I made a commitment that I was going to reach as many people as I could while I was alive. So, and then afterwards, I'm using a Ouija board after I pass. There'll be Ouija board connections. You'll just tune in to me on a Ouija board. <laughs> oh. I'm joking. <laughs> I'm okay, joking. that was an invitation, everybody. So I'm <laughs> joking. <laughs> Now there'll be recordings there, but but um, you know I, I've got the Demartini method that's about to go on on app, so they'll be able to do it on their phones. So that's in the making. We've had lots and lots of projects that are going on. So many of them. Um, movies are going. There's a movie that's going. They're doing on my life coming up. There's a whole lot of stuff that's going on. That that um, I mean, I, I just thousands of things. I keep a long list of things I'm working on. There's some are long life things. Some are after life. There's there's. There's goals from now all the way past my life, still in motion. You are still adhering to what Paul Braggs recommended, 120 years past your life and beyond the influence that you will leave and the change you will bestow upon us. So thank you. And thank you. Well, so you, you know, it isn't, I don't think there's anything more valuable, more meaningful, more fulfilling in life than watching the lives change the people you touch. And uh, I, I, I've asked that every country I've been in, and I, I find that you fully, 100% of the people put their hands up, go, that's what is fulfilling. So why, why would you want to do anything less? Why would you want to put your time onto something that's less fulfilling when you can put it on the most fulfilling? It doesn't make any sense to me. Read his book, The Values Factor. If you want to go to one of his events, drdmartini.com. It has an events calendar, as well as that free questionnaire he was talking about, because clearly, as he's a great example, as you change your life, you change everybody else's life. And that's really what it's all about. And I end today's show with this quote from Dr. John Demartini. Being a master of persistence means embracing both support and challenge in the pursuit of your dreams. I thank you so much for coming on today. It's been such a pleasure. No, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to share. And uh, thank you for making the difference and helping me make a difference. Mm. Next up on Dare to Dream Radio and Podcast, I'm featuring Ken Honda, who is Japan's best-selling Zen millionaire. He wrote the New York Times best-selling book, Happy Money. So we're taking this conversation and even more, again, into money. It's going to show you things you've never considered before. Give a Ken a hug for me. <laughs> oh, I will. I'm so excited. He's so full of joy, this man. So we'll look at his wallet at his happy money, too. <laughs> Thanks for subscribing to the show and thank you for daring to dream and considering to turn those dreams into your reality, which benefits us all.